so now if i want to explain the bending stress so bending stress is when the transverse load is acting on the beam it tries to deflect the beam or bend the beam to resist the deflection or bending of the beam internal resistive forces are developed which are called as stresses in the beam now we come to the theory of simple bending that means i want to derive a formula to find out the bending stress now to find out the bending stress we are going to derive a formula and when we are going to derive some formula we have to make certain assumptions then and then we can derive a particular theory so this particular theory is called as a theory of simple bending two things are very important is, uh, in the theory of simple bending first is that the topmost fibers they are subjected to compression the bottommost fibers are subjected to tension if we are assuming a sagging bending moment right now what are the assumptions that are made in the simple bending theory that will go through the first assumption is the material of the beam is assumed to be homogeneous perfectly elastic and isotropic now three important words are there the first is homogeneous second is perfectly elastic and third is isotropic now what do you mean by the term homogeneous homogeneous means the composition of the beam is uniform throughout composition of the beam is uniform throughout means that if it is of a rectangular shape and it if, if it is made up of wooden then it is throughout of wooden sh uh, material okay so that is basically called as homogeneous second important word is what isotropic isotropic means isotropic is it is having all the elastic constants like modulus of elasticity modulus of rigidity bulk modulus that is e g and k they are same in all the directions directions in the beam that is x y and z direction and the third is elastic elastic means it is trying to follow hooke's law what does hooke's law say hooke's law say that within elastic limit stress is proportional to strain so i'll explain you with a simple example you all must have uh, performed the practical of uh, mild steel bar for tensile right and you must have uh, plotted a graph of stress versus strain right so what does stress versus strain say that within elastic limit the stress is proportional to strain this graph is called as a graph of stress versus strain for a mild steel bar now you can see over here that we are getting a straight line what does this straight line indicate the straight line indicates that if i remove the load the body will come back to its original shape and size but in this particular case what does this show that if there is some change in the length then that change will remain permanent after removal of the load also the permanent change in the shape and size of the material will be there right so the hooke's law says that within elastic limit stress is proportional to strain so our assumption that the material is homogeneous elastic and isotropic is that perfectly elastic means hooke's law is obeyed and no permanent set is formed on unloading so this is our first assumption now our second assumption is all transverse section of the beams which are plane before bending will remain plane after bending that means if we are assuming that our beam is uh, plane so it will remain plane even after the bending third is the radius of curvature of the beam before bending is very large in comparison to its transverse dimensions now what do you mean by the term radius of curvature so for radius of curvature again we can take a simple uh, example of our beam right we had taken one beam like this so suppose this is a beam right this is a beam i'm uh, taking 
a section of a beam right and if the bending has taken place. So, we can show the bending in this particular manner right. Now, if we extend the lines or the end points they meet at one particular point right. So, the distance of the neutral axis and the point of intersection of two end points that is basically nothing but radius of curvature r right. So, what does this say that when the beam is plane definitely its radius of curvature will be more, but when it is bending ok when the bending is taking place. So, at that time if you try to have these end points intersect. So, the radius of curvature will be less. So, what they are assuming that the radius of curvature of the beam before bending is very large in comparison to its transverse dimensions. This implies that the beam is initially straight. The fourth assumption is that the resultant pull or push across any transverse section of the beam is 0. Thus, the total tensile force is equal to the compressive force in the beam cross section. Fifth is the Young's modulus of elasticity is same in tension and compression and the last is the stresses are within the proportional limit. So, this is what I was talking about radius of curvature that the topmost layers are basically subjected to compression, the bottom most layers are subjected to tension, but that is one portion which remains plane even after bending ok and that basically is nothing but neutral axis that I will talk later on. So, now if I want to derive the formula for bending stress theory. So, we are considering a simple bending of a beam which is shown in the figure this is the figure we are showing a beam. Uh, we are considering a transverse section that is A, B, C and D in the figure A. So, in the unloaded state let G H be the fiber at a distance y from the centroidal axis K L. So, what we are doing? <coughs> we are taking a beam, we are finding out its centroid. So, centroid is passing through line K L, we are taking a fiber layer G H, the distance of this layer G H is y with respect to the centroidal axis, its length being determined by two transverse parallel planes A D and B C. So, we are taking two parallel planes A D and B C as you can see in figure A. For figure 4.2 B shows the beam after bending when loaded and the planes A D and B C assumes the position A 1, D 1 and B 1, C 1 respectively. So, you can see in this particular diagram that figure B shows the bending and the position A D changes to A 1 D 1 and position B C changes to B 1 C 1 ok. The planes A 1 D 1 and B 1 C 1 intersect at point O the center of curvature and are inclined at an angle of theta. So, you can see that A 1 and D 1 and B 1 and C 1 if the line extends they intersect at point O which I have explained over here right that after bending if this is the bending right if this is a 1 d 1 and if this is b 1 c 1. So, if I try to extend these lines they will intersect at one particular point and that point is nothing but point of curvature right and the center of curvature we are giving it by O and the centroidal axis and the point of curvature these distance is nothing 
but radius of curvature r. So, let r be the radius of curvature of the centroidal fibers even f 1 even f 1 with point O. Okay? So, this is shown in our figure. Now, we are considering one layer that is G 1 H 1. So, this is the layer G 1 H 1. Okay? G 1 h 1 and its distance with respect to centroidal axis is y okay? and the distance of even h 1 is r. Okay? So, now if I want to find out the g 1 h 1, g 1 h 1 is nothing but what arc length. So, if I want to find out the arc length, so what will be arc length g 1 h 1? So, G 1 H 1 arc length will be nothing but the radius and the angle formed. What is the angle formed? Theta. What is the radius? So, up to this that is r plus y that is the distance multiplied by the theta. So, r plus y into theta that is the length G 1 H 1 and even F 1. So, what is the distance up to even f 1 from our point of curvature r. So, r and what is the angle formed theta. So, the arc length g 1 h 1 is r plus y into theta and for even f 1 it is r into theta. So, now if we proportionate g 1 h 1 upon even f 1. So, we get g 1 h 1 upon even f 1 is equal to r plus y into theta upon r theta. So, theta will cancel out, we will get r plus y upon r that is g 1 h 1 upon even f 1. But we know that even f 1 is which layer? Even f 1 is nothing but the neutral axis layer or we can also call it as that layer which does not compress or which does not elongate. Okay? So, that is this layer which neither compresses nor elongates that layer is nothing but the neutral axis and that is nothing but even h 1 right. So, even h 1 can be replaced by e f that is why we have replaced even f 1 by e f. So, we get our final equation as r plus y upon r is equal to g 1 h 1 upon e f. So, we have uh, found out the arc lengths. Now, we go to the strain. What is strain basically? In simple words, if I want to say strain, what is strain? Strain is nothing but change in length upon original length. Right? That means delta L upon L that is called as strain. Now, if I want to find out delta L, delta L is initial length minus final length. So, what is my final length? So, final length is nothing but even f 1 and what is my initial length e f. Okay? So, delta L upon L that is called as strain and delta L is given by final length minus original length. Okay? So, now we come to our this strain in the fibers. So, epsilon that is equal to g 1 h 1 minus g h upon g h. So, g 1 h 1 minus g h, g h can be replaced by what? E f because E f is the original length. So, g 1 h 1 minus E f upon E f. So, the g 1 h 1 upon E f minus E f upon E f that is 1. So, g 1 h 1 is replaced by what we have calculated as r plus y upon r minus r. So, if minus 1. So, if we take our LCM, what we will get? R plus y minus r upon r. So, r r will get cancelled out. So, y upon r. So, absolute uh, that is our strain that is nothing but we are getting the value of strain that is equal to y upon r. Okay? And strain is denoted by epsilon. So, y upon r that is we are getting. Okay. Now, bending stress is denoted by what? Sigma. So, sigma that is nothing but bending stress that is bending stress. Now, we know that our fibers are 
obeying Hooke's law. So, within elastic limit, elastic limit stress is proportional to strain. Okay? So, I can say that sigma that is equal to elastic constant that is E and strain that is epsilon. So, sigma that is equal to E into epsilon. What we have calculated for epsilon? Y upon R. So, sigma that is equal to ap modulus of elasticity into Y upon R. Okay? So, that is what I have shown in the derivation over here. Then, uh, we can calculate or we can take a small area of a section that we have considered over here that is which is shown in our figure. See, I am drawing it over here that if this is a small area uh, or a area that we are considering in that particular thing we are taking a small length d a okay? and it is lying at a distance of y. So, that is shown in our figure c over here that neutral axis is n a then a small area in the figure c kindly see in the figure c a small section having area d a it is lying at a distance of y with respect to neutral axis. So, if I want to find out the force so basically what is force? Force that is stress upon area or in other words I can say stress is equal to what force into area. So, force is equal to stress upon area. Stress is denoted by what? Sigma and area is denoted by what? A. But if we are considering a small section, so we can consider it to be small force d f is equal to sigma into small area d a. Right? So, we can get sigma upon y is equal to sigma 1 upon y 1. So, I can say sigma that is equal to sigma 1 into y upon y 1. So, d f is equal to sigma 1 into y upon y 1 into d a. So, the total tensile force on the transfer section below the centroidal axis as shown in our figure d in our figure d. So, this is the figure d in which it is shown that the small stress